So good afternoon, good morning, and welcome to this first webinar in our series of Teledyne Blue U 3D multi-beam scanning sonar. As we did for the last couple of training sessions we've had in the Blue View sonars, we have our tech gurus, John and Tyler, who will take you through the fascinating world of the 3D sonars. You're welcome to ask questions through this uh, question chat function in the dashboard, and the questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. I would also like to let you know that the webinar is being recorded, so you can at any time go back and find it or revisit it, um, and all the other webinars we're presenting during the 15, last 15 months. You'll find them on our webpage, on the resources, and our webinar um, platform called Link. Many of you, I'm sure, have already met John and Tyler virtually. Um, so, but for those who have not met them yet, I'll just let them briefly introduce themselves before they start the presentation. So, um, there you go, John and Tyler. Floor yeah, yours. Thanks, Ella, for the introduction. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, my name is John Robertson. I'm the customer service manager for um, the imaging group in North and South America. I've been with the company. Uh, for just over 12 years now and um, started with the Blueview brand and integrated into the imaging group over the last uh, uh, five, six years. Um, uh, Tyler has, uh, I think you just hit, what, nine years with us and yeah. started so with the Blueview brand. Ago. Yeah, so he started also with the Blueview brand uh, doing lots of uh, field installations, training, um, uh, application support and uh, again over the last few years um, integrating into the imaging group um, into the uh, Resan and Odom brand lines as well uh, and we have with us today a surprise uh, uh, that uh, might chime in here or there Kyle Nading uh, has joined us um, virtually as well he's uh, uh, Kyle, how long has it been? Uh, you, you've been with the group, also starting with the Blueview brand. Um, about six years. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's about six years. Uh, similar, similar roles: um, uh, uh, training, uh, installation, field support, uh, customer support. Uh, also working with the, uh, the the rest of the imaging brands as well. Um, so thanks uh, again for everybody joining. And uh, Tyler, I'll I'll pass it to you to to kick off the the presentation. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks, Hella and Kyle. Um, yeah, so welcome back, everyone who has uh, been attending the Blueview webinar series. Uh, we've had two already on the, on the 2D systems. Um, we're going to jump into the 3D systems now. There's going to be three webinars. Um, the first is kind of today is going to be hardware overview. Then we're going to jump into software, of which software is a lot more involved with the 3D than it is with the 2D. So we've kind of have separate webinars for those. Um, and if this is your first Blueview webinar, uh, welcome. We hope you check out the last couple that are actually recorded. Uh, you can access those online. We can we can send out a link. Uh, and then again, we hope you attend the future webinars. So we will jump in here. So. Today, again, we're reviewing the, the BV5000 product, which is our 3D mechanical scanning sonar product. Um, I guess, first of all, can you guys see the screen all right? Yes. Okay. I see, always... I see the, main, the main slide, yeah. Yeah, got it. Always good to check. Okay, so BV5000, just general overview. Um, it's a 3D scanning sonar and multi-beam profiler uh, kind of in one uh, just to describe what we're seeing here let me bring out my cursor um, so here's the system itself uh, we'll actually point here this is the actual bb5000 um, the tripod is a very common part of the kit we'll talk about that later um, but the bb5000 as it's named is the product of the sonar the profiler and a, a pan and tilt so these two together with a, a nice little clamp uh, create the BB5000. So um, typical, I guess, traditional deployment is on a tripod or some static mount um, nearby, let's say, a structure for scour, undercut monitoring, um, bottom contour monitoring, looking at debris inspection, uh, pre and post construction verification. So typically deployed on the seafloor, um, a scan is completed and we have a, a 3D point cloud of the area. Um, let me 
Yeah, so if you're familiar with multi-beam surveying in general, typically we're talking about just using uh, the profiler head itself on a surface vessel on your boat uh, and using the motion of the boat to actually generate your data. Um, what we've done is just taken that multi traditional kind of multi-beam component, put it on a pan and tilt, and we're using the pan motion uh, in place of the boat motion. So um, we're basically scanning the surrounding area. Um, if you wanted to, you could certainly take the head off, put it on your surface vessel, and more of a traditional kind of mowing the lawn multi-beam uh, setup. But the BB5000, as we're going to review it today, is actually the more uh, standard setup of panning. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. Um, and I say a few of the uh, applications here. There's, of course, with as with the 2D, there's dozens more, and we're constantly surprised about what our customers come up with in using this tool. Um, and we'll kind of talk about a few of those unique uses as, as we go on. So just specifications briefly. Uh, we only offer just one frequency uh, at this time with the BV5000. It's a 1.35 1, 1 megahertz or 1350 kilohertz is, is I'll refer it to it. Um, the field of view here is 42 degrees by one degree. So you can you can really contrast that with the 2D system, which is 130 degrees by we'll say 20 degrees. Um, so this is really the biggest difference between the 2D and the 3D is this field of view. Um, and the reason there's a reason it's one degree, which we'll kind of talk about, but um, we do just have a small 42 degree opening. Uh, the plus side is we do have a tilt mechanism um, and the tilt basically gives us effectively a larger field of view because we can, we can tilt up and down. Um, so the 42 degree, we're not really limited by that in most most cases. Um, so that's why it can be much smaller than the 130 uh, degrees. So max range is 30 meters um, because it's such a high frequency signal. It's not not very high. We have an optimal range of one to 20 meters. Uh, anything over 20 meters, you're not going to get the highest, I guess, resolution data. You're going, your signal is going to attenuate at that point. Uh, it's going to get much weaker returns. So you're not going to get uh, the best data af after beyond 20 meters. Um, size of the system, like any blue view, it's it's quite compact. Uh, depth rating, 1,000 or 4,000 meter if you do have a, a deep rated requirement. And then a, a resolution is about 1.5 centimeters. Um, that's kind of under ideal circumstances. Uh, I could give a whole webinar on resolution and how to uh, interpret that, but we won't dive into that too much. Uh, I can go into it a bit later if, if people do have more questions on it. Probably a little bit of a good one for the data review um, webinar. We'll jump into that a little yeah, more. Yeah, absolutely. Good idea. Um, okay, so basic operation. Uh, as I kind of mentioned before, we have a 42 degree here by one degree. Uh, we have 256 beams. It's the multi-beam sonar. Um, it's placed on the pan and tilt. In this case, we're on a tripod. Uh, we can see the swath is actually vertical here. Um, and what we're doing is we're scanning this, let me go to the next slide. We're scanning this one degree vertical swath around the environment up to 360 degrees. Um, it doesn't have to be 360, but typically people do a full 360 swing to, to get capture data of the entire environment. Um, and as we're scanning, we're kind of interpreting this raw acoustic data and we're generating soundings we're generating points thousands of points um, which you can actually see here so same image uh, we're scanning in this case just this bridge footer um, and as we're scanning we're generating these points and we're generating a xyz point cloud uh, so the result after the scan is going to be something like this it is going to be this in fact so uh, we have a bridge footer here we can actually see the pipe that's pictured here. This is obviously not a, a real picture, but <laughs> it's a you know animation. Um, with this point cloud, obviously you have a lot of benefits. You can take measurements, uh, distance, volume measurements. Uh, you can do very you know kind of fine tune inspections. Uh, you can obviously zoom, pan around, uh, do all kinds of modeling, CAD modeling. So a lot of power 
in an XYZ point cloud uh, versus just the raw 2D data. Um, that's kind of where the inspection aspect comes in and, and having such a huge benefit for structure inspection among many other things. Um, so that's kind of the basic operation, uh, just essentially scanning, panning the system around your environment and creating all the sonar data that the software then uses to generate a 3D picture. Um, we do this over and over again. We have all these 3D pictures and we can bring them all together. Uh, that's what I'm gonna talk about later. That's getting into software, but that's kind of the general concept, uh, the general operation. Um, so looking at that picture again, just a few things, a few kind of uh, characteristics of the image. So generally the coloring is a big part of, of 3D point clouds. Uh, by default, we usually have it colored by depth. Uh, in this case, the shallower is colored more red hues. As we get deeper, we're, we're going more to the blue side of the spectrum. Um, you can color by intensity. You can color by any kind of custom color scheme you want, but typically color by depth is the most, most useful. Just like with the 2D, we have a shadows, you know, where we're actually not getting acoustic returns from. In this case, behind the bridge footer, we're getting no soundings returned. Um, therefore, we have a shadow. Uh, and then scan spot. This is pretty unique uh, characteristic of the BB5000 in that it's just a blind spot below, in this case, it below the tripod. So we can only tilt down so much to fill in that donut hole, as I call it, um, but it'll typically be a part of your scan regardless. Um, if you do multiple scans, multiple locations, you can end up filling in that blind spot with the other scans, but um, that's that's where that's where you'll see kind of this blind spot and a lot of the data we're going to look at you'll see where the tripod was placed just from this this blind spot um, so looking at kind of a I guess we'll call a raw data set so we just deployed the tripod we took a scan and we're getting a resulting point cloud that looks like this um, so we have a few things going on here this is particularly for shallow water um, we can see kind of the the pilings we can see the sea the sea floor the bottom return but then we're getting all this reflection right so what's happening as you can probably imagine is the acoustic signal in, in shallow water is going to for example hit the bottom um, multi-path kind of back to the surface and then return back to the bottom creating effectively a, a mirror image of the bottom which is what we see here and we can actually see it's hard to see because this isn't data it's a screenshot but there's actually the surface is right here you can kind of see the line so shallow water you're going to get a lot of noise generally uh, you're going to require a little more post-processing in the way of cleaning the data um, but it's always good to just kind of orient yourself and know what is a reflection and what's not a reflection um, you know the actual real data is going to be a lot higher resolution a lot clearer less fuzzy um, however, I have been on some deployments. I've, I've used, have seen some scans where the reflection looks very close in kind of clarity to the actual data. Um, in that case, you just have to orient yourself and know how this how the system is sitting on the seafloor and kind of where you were looking. Um, you know, generally the real data is going to be <laughs> on the bottom and the Reflection is going to be on the top. That's, of course, a good rule to go by, but things can get very strange depending on how many surfaces are reflecting off of, you know, where the actual water surface is, the, you know, the water conditions. So um, we'll go over. If, yeah, if, go if the water surface reflection becomes an issue in these shallow water environments, we'll talk about these sonar targets um, later on in the webinar. You can always introduce an, uh, a, a uh, artificial target to really reference uh, yourself to to what is true and what is uh, what is a reflection as well. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll go over some data that will kind of show this a little more clear. Um, platforms. Uh, I've been talking generally about just the tripod deployment. Um, it's what we what we typically sell the system with the tripod. Uh, we just have kind of a lightweight aluminum tripod, which you can see here. Um, that is by no means what you have to stick with. As time has gone on in this product's lifespan, we've seen a lot of different creative ways to 
attach the sonar to various different platforms, whether it's a multi-million dollar work class ROV or a smaller ROV um, or, or any tripod or plate of your choosing. So we'll go through just a couple examples of those here. Um, and I'll, I'll actually kind of revert to John, because as we can see, John here, a much, a much younger John, um, <laughs> deploying a BB-5000, I believe in Chicago. Um, yeah, it's been the, uh, one, of the, one of the rivers in Chicago, uh, downtown. Um, yeah, you can see the tripod. It's, uh, it's lightweight, um, hand deployable by one person over the side of, uh, of you know, bridge or anything. Um, uh, you can't see my cursor, but in the bottom right picture, uh, we're, we're standing on top of the bridge that's pictured in the background of the top left picture, um, looking downward. And there's a set of pilings there um, that we wanted to get some images of. Uh, if you look in the top left picture again, on the other side of the river, there's a yellow uh, bumper. That is actually what was on top of those pilings and had broken off. Um, and so in, in the point cloud data set, on the bottom left, uh, the the donut, the the blank scanned area uh, on the left hand side uh, shows. Oh, is it? oh, there you go. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that was full data. Sorry, go on. <clears throat> um, yeah, you can see the donut in the left hand side where the uh, blue, red, and uh, green X Y Z coordinates show the the blank space. There's actually the the top of that donut uh, or that bumper. Uh, that had broken off and fallen right next to the pilings, uh, but you can't see it from the surface uh, surface photo. Uh, but just an interesting shallow water environment um, uh, scan of this uh, this area. Um, so tripod deployment. There you go. Yeah. So this is the actual data set. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but um, we can actually see we have a shopping cart down here. Is a fun thing I always like to point out and. Um, yeah, you can actually see the, the pilings from the picture. Uh, and then three scan spots. There might be four, but I, I see three pretty clearly here. So, yeah, that, this project or you know demo made me nervous because we, we didn't know that that uh, uh, cap was broken off and actually put in that place. We dropped the tripod right on top of it and almost got it stuck in the, in the river. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, fun. Okay. Yeah, I won't, didn't really mean to go too much in depth on that data, so we'll move on here. Um, Maybe have a closer look in the, in the review. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or again. Um, yeah, so ROV, like I mentioned, this is becoming more common, particularly uh, smaller, kind of, I guess, micro ROVs or, or even up to inspection class ROVs uh, mounting the BV5000. You can see it here on a Seabotics vehicle, a BLBB vehicle. Um, this effectively acts as a mobile tripod. We're not necessarily scanning while moving, while flying the ROV through the water column. Uh, we're generally just flying the ROV, landing on the bottom, positioning it in a stable place, scanning, and then easily moving it 10, 15 meters down the structure, whatever we're looking at, scanning again. Um, so it's a kind of a, a mobile tripod, but much easier than hand deploying uh, a tripod or having a diver move the tripod, which is a common approach. Uh, so this is quite a nice tool to have in your ROV toolkit. Um, and then, as I mentioned, work class ROVs. This is a very uh, old fashioned uh, Blue View application, just sticking these on a large ROV, doing a subsea tree, you know, rig inspections, things like that. Um, and then I'll revert back to John. This was kind of an interesting one. Special integrations, like I said, people find any number of ways to get these things mounted and, and get the data they need. So, John, if you want to explain this sure. briefly. Yeah, this may be a good one to, for data review as well. But uh, essentially, in the in the photo in the middle on the bottom uh, is a little uh, river, very shallow, maybe two feet deep. Um, and this was a turn in the river. And the farm behind there, they had built this retention wall with some uh, protective blocks below the wall. Um, and it, it's kind of hard to tell just from the, the image, but the data image shows, you can see the, the blocks, the, the edge of the blocks uh, right there. And then um, there's actually undercut happening because of the water flow um, underneath those blocks. So 
the the um, farm uh, you know owners were interested to see if there was any uh, any scour going on there to to see if they needed to do any more protection of that that retaining wall itself. But um, yeah, it'd be this would be a good one to review in the data data yeah. reprocessing because it's uh, there's a few yeah. things here that are. Um, and and we intend to. That's in the in the next webinar when we deep dive into the software. We're actually going to review this data set because it is is an interesting one. Um, and yeah, they used uh, I think they they built this kind of custom <laughs> tripod because it was two feet of water. Uh, we had to get the sonar basically sitting on the bottom, the pen until on the bottom. So they had this nice little rig where the the arms folded down for the scan. Um, we also we used to build these heavy plates, 70 pound steel plate, uh, really good for high current situations, obviously putting a tripod in a, you know, five plus knot current river is not always a good idea. So having a nice heavy plate to look for scour uh, under bridges, for example, uh, is, a, is a very good tool to have. So really you can put the pan and tilt on anything, anything with the bull pattern, um, you can attach it to. And like I said, we've seen some creative uses. So by no means are you restricted to the tripod. And the the, the heavy plate uh, and, and four or five knot currents, you definitely want to use a a, a, a wench to to mm -hmm. deploy that, not uh, yeah. not deployable yeah. by hand, definitely. Yeah, and it's generally shallow water. I, I've actually tried to deploy the tripod, or I think it was the plate in, yeah, what was it? It was in the San Francisco Bay. It was 150 feet of water. And just with the tidal currents, we ended up having it act like a kite. And by the time it hit bottom, it was it was you know half a kilometer Here's away from us. Yeah. So yeah. Um, deeper water deployment of tripod or plate or anything is is a lot trickier. That's where you might want to look into ROV uh, deployment or or at least have a diver to assist if possible. Um, but yeah, it's case by case. So we look at it depending on what the application is, and that's where we can kind of help create a project plan um so the, the, the main application yeah the main goal is uh, in this type of deployment is to um get the sonar and pan and tilt to be as stable as possible so that there's yeah. no movement during the scans because that will introduce uh, uh, errors in the data yeah you can think of it like a like a camera i always give the camera analogy if you have a shutter open on a camera you're taking say a long exposure photo any movement of the camera or in the camera frame for that matter is going to show up as kind of a blur in the final photo. So exact same concept with the BB-5000. So we want it, want it to be still. Obviously we can't control fish swimming in front of it. That's going to appear as kind of a, a blurred line, but um, we do want it to be as static as possible. Um, there is cases where you can be in motion. We'll talk about that in a few slides, but that's that's a whole different kind of deployment so um, software I'm not going to read over all this so we're going to spend the next two webinars really focusing on these first two steps um, the software steps so just brief overview the acquisition software what connects to the sonar pan and tilt what what does the scans what generates the point cloud really kind of the core software is called ProScan um, so that's what we're going to go over in the next webinar um, that's the main acquisition software. Um, Blue Viewer is kind of just a basic point cloud viewer. Um, not much else to it. You can't edit, you can't register point clouds, you can just view them. So it's a good kind of, um, good way to kind of verify your data in the field. Once you complete your scan, you can open up Blue Viewer, take a look, make sure, okay, my scan looks good, and then carry on with the, the survey. Uh, the next step, Stitch, uh, is post-processing. So I always say typically you can plan for every every hour spent collecting data, you can almost kind of mirror that on the post-processing side. If you collect data for eight hours, you might want to expect eight hours post-processing. Um, depends on your skill level, depends on a lot of factors, but it's a good baseline I like to mention. Um, so a couple packages for this, we have Quick Stitch software, we have, uh, not we, but there's a free open source software called Cloud Compare. Uh, Leica Geosystems has software called Cyclone. Um, we really, at this point, we just recommend whatever people are comfortable with. If you've used any of these software packages before, that's the one you should go with generally. Um, we do kind of uh, back 
Quick Stitch and we actually sell Quick Stitch um, as a product. It's actually made by Iva Geosystem. Uh, I'm not sure what they're called, but uh, over in Europe. Um, so we do have a lot of our own training material on Quick Stitch. However, something like Cloud Compare is, of course, free um, and has a lot of community source kind of uh, support with it. So a lot of YouTube videos, a lot of tutorials online that not that we made, but that the community around them made. Um, and then again, there's a number of other point point cloud processing software suites. So we'll focus on Quick Stitch in our third webinar of this series. Um, but again, it's it's really up up to you and what you need. Um, and then of course deliverable. So again, we'll focus more on the software, so I'm not going to really go much more into it. Um, so scanning, just general scan plan, as I call it, um, making sure you have all the data you need over a large area. Um, usually one scan of an area is not going to cut it. Usually you're going to need multiple scans of your, your structure or wherever you're trying to get a 3D image of. Um, so what we need to do is we're going to need to, of course, register those scans together after the fact. That's where the post-processing software comes in. Um, in order to register scans together, we need overlap. Generally, we need lots of overlap. Um, we also need common reference points, common, common objects. So we can see on this wall between this, say, scan one and two, we're going to have a couple of these, I don't know what these are, a couple pilings in common. That way in the software, um, we can basically say these two objects physically in the real world are the same and the software will basically say, okay, I can align these two scans, I can stitch them together based on these common overlapped objects. So, um, you know, I don't wanna give exact numbers of how much overlap you need, how far apart to space them. Generally, I'll say 10 to 20 meters, you can space apart scan locations. Um, but it all depends on what you're looking at, depends on the application. So um, yeah, it depends on the complexity of the area, how many targets are in the in the overlapping areas, yeah. um, things like that. Yeah, and I always say err on the side of more overlap, always, because you can if you go back and you try to register together two point clouds that don't have enough overlap, you're going to have a very difficult time and you're going to potentially introduce huge inaccuracies in your data. Um, so the more always, scans, the better. Yeah, always um, time permitting. But yeah, that's why it's very good to have a scan plan, uh, as I mentioned, which we'll go over in a couple slides here. Um, so in our reference targets, uh, I think John mentioned this before, but if you if you're in an area, maybe offshore is a common one where there's there's really no objects in your environment to to designate as overlapping objects. There's just flat, featureless seabed. Um, that's where you kind of have to use some type of object. You have to actually place an object on the seafloor to use as a reference point. Um, we used to sell these, I think, but they're, they're very easy to make, these wire mesh balls. This one's half a meter in diameter. Um, you put it on a stand, a lightweight stand. You have a diver or hand deploy it to the bottom. Um, and you have something like this. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six of these SRTs. Uh, we can see the sonar here, and we're trying to actually scan this structure, uh, and we wanna actually scan this structure, but we want them to be kind of geolocated properly to each other. Um, but if we have, say, 100 meters, or we'll say 50 meters of featureless seabed between the two, we need to figure out a way to tie those together properly. And we do that with the SRTs. So we basically have a scan here of structure one. We place these three, we place all six objects really, um, all six SRTs. And then we do one scan in the middle to tie them together. And then the third scan of, of structure two. Um, that way we have all these reference objects that we can easily in the software say, this is an SRT that has not moved this entire time and that's an object that can tie these two scans together. Um, so usually not needed in inshore applications, depending on what you're looking at. You have pilings, you have tires, you have shopping carts, um, you have just all kinds of stuff in the water that you can use. Um, and the structures, that, the structure itself, of course. Um, but having some kind of identifiable object, even if you deploy it, 
makes your life so much easier in post-processing. Um, it's just going to make the post-processing much more streamlined uh, and less less frustrating <laughs> above anything else. And, I, and and even more accurate, if, even if you have a structure um, that you're specifically um, specifically scanning, for example, a bridge footer, you have a bridge footer and it's fairly flat face and fairly flat seabed, you know, you can typically register those together fairly easily. Uh, but sometimes that one extra target will will add an extra point and make it more accurate overall. Yep. A um, couple important ones I need to get over here where we're running short on time, but um, I did mention motion scan as we call it. So we've been talking about static deployment. You have to keep the system still. Um, people ask, well, I want to use it on my boat or while in motion. The answer is you can, but we're getting a lot more complicated in that case because then we need, you know, we need motion sensors, heading sensors, positioning. Um, we need all these other, all this other data coming in to basically georeference and motion compensate the sonar data. So we're talking full survey software packages like Teledyne PDS, like HiPack, and we're talking a lot of other sensors, you know, headings, GPS, motion sensor. Um, once you, those are all brought together into software like Teledyne PDS, um, then we can effectively run it from a boat and do scans from the surface, do kind of, I guess, fixed mode, more traditional multi-beam uh, passes. So that's the answer to kind of whether you can use it in motion is yes, but it, it, comp it makes the deployment much more complex. Um, last kind of important slide here. A lot of considerations when doing this more so than the 2D, you really need to have what I call a scan plan. Um, draw, hand draw, or, or otherwise download, print out a map of your area. Uh, just kind of tentatively plan out where you're going to deploy the tripod, making sure you have enough overlap. Um, that also helps in post-processing. When you have your, your drawn map, you can see, oh, scan one, what I labeled the, X, the XYZ file as scan one, that's going to be right here. Scan two is here, three is here, and you can really, it makes it a lot easier to actually post-process because you kind of know, you have an actual drawing of where things are. Um, so very important to have some idea of what you're getting into rather than just drop in the tripod where, where you think you should. Um, verifying targets, making sure you do have either an SRT or you have some object in your scan that you can then use to tie together data. Um, communication, as with any survey, making sure there's very clear communication um, for, for both good data and for safety, of course. Um, reviewing data, it's always a good idea to review data on the fly. As you take a scan, blue viewer will appear. You'll look at the point cloud. Don't Not necessarily the time for measurements, maybe, but really just looking, making sure you have the data you need moving on. And then uh, afterwards in the office or wherever you can, you can really put it under a microscope. Um, and then note any changes here. So I wanted to get into just a couple quick data sets because... And to add to your comment on reviewing data, you know, it's important to review it in the field, especially um, making sure, you know, tripod didn't move during the scan, uh, didn't fall over during the scan, or, um, you know, not, every, not everything goes according to the plan, to the scan mm -hmm. plans. So you want to make sure you have good coverage yeah. from one to the to the next and you you, you didn't uh, stray too far away and there's not enough overlap to, to do the registration from one to the other, so. Right, so data set here, hopefully everyone can see it. Uh, this is actually a bridge, this is one point cloud, this is a raw data set. So we actually see some kind of just bubbles, some noise that we'll have to clean out. Um, this is a minus 15 degree scan, so obviously zero degree minus 15. Uh, so we're getting a lot of good data of these kind of sandbags, whatever is, is reinforcing the bridge, uh, but we're not getting the entire bridge here. Uh, so what we'll typically do is do like a plus 15 scan. This is shallow water too. So just minus 15 plus 15. So if I pull in the plus 15 scan, um, we can see kind of what it does. It, it gives us a lot more noise but it's because we're effectively looking up at the surface. So we're getting the entire bridge footer here. 
as you can see here, but we're getting all this surface reflection. So this is kind of a, a real data example of what I went over earlier, which is you're getting a, a kind of a fuzzy reflection of the bottom um, here and, and the bridge footer as well. And this data here is actually the surface. So it's not very clear it's the surface, but you can tell there's some data points picked that basically indicate that is our water surface. So if I kind of even, even out my view, we have reflection, real data. So. And you can even see the the bottom of the vessel that's uh, nose nosing up oh, to yeah. the bridge footer, and that uh, on the left hand side now, that's all prop wash actually, uh, from the because oh, the vessel okay. pushing up nosing up against the bridge footer. You're right. Yeah, so uh, it's good because we did get all the data we needed on the bridge footer. There's just a uh, maybe even one step in cleaning. What I would what I would do is basically you know, do my cursor, drag around these surface points above the surface and just hit hit delete and I'm done, they're gone. So just uh, worth it to have the data, even though it, it initially doesn't look clean and requires some cleaning. Um, so quick multi-path example I have. Uh, this is actually a really good one. So here's a data set. Uh, the tripod is located here. We're in kind of a, a quarry of some type. Uh, where we have one, two, three walls. Um, but we're getting some interesting things happening here. So if we look over here, particularly this corner, um, we're kind of seeing some missing points on the corner. And in fact, we're seeing a wall extend beyond the corner here. So the question is, how is the sonar seeing through this wall and imaging something behind it? The answer is it's not. Right, it's it's multipathing. So what's happening is the sonar is here. The acoustic signal is basically uh, coming out, hitting this really strong, not strong, this concrete, hard concrete structure. Uh, it's potentially bouncing multiple times in the corner or bouncing off other hard concrete surfaces, and then it's returning to the sonar. Now the sonar doesn't know what path that signal took. It has no idea. It just knows the time it's traveled and you know when it returns so because the sonar is not you know intelligent in that way it's going to think all that bouncing is just imaging beyond the wall so it's going to actually put points beyond the wall and make kind of what looks like an actual wall behind the wall um, so multipathing can be tricky there's all kinds of ways it can represent itself um, it takes some practice to have that trained eye to identify Oh, that's multipathing. In this case, we just know there's no wall behind here. Um, this is kind of a hard wall, and this is just all multipathing fake data. Um, unfortunately, in this case, the multipath return signal, the strength of it was stronger than the actual return from the wall. So it actually, the software actually said, oh, these are the real points back here, not the points on the actual wall, which is why we kind of have a lot of missing data. Um, on the wall here. So uh, a lot of things we can do to address this in post-processing. We can rerun the scan with different settings. We'll go over that in the next webinar. Um, so it's not all lost. If, if we go back and we realize, realize we have this multipathing, it's fine. We can kind of, we can rerun the data to make it, I don't know, disappear, but make the data much. Make it lo look uh, like the true wall itself is there. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, uh, before you move on, if you have any any other examples, uh, just a reminder: if anybody has any questions, please uh, type them into the chat section, uh, and we'll uh, we'll we'll get to questions as they come in, uh, as we as we wrap up here. Yep. And this is my last data set. Um, this is just kind of showing a complete data set. Uh, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine. I'd say probably 10 plus scan locations here. Um, so we can see, I don't know if they use SRTs, but we can see the <clears> tripod <throat> was placed across this channel to this bridge footer here, and then around the bridge footer um, to really kind of get a good survey of this entire area. Um, so very high resolution, um, highly accurate survey here. Um, did take some time, of course, to post-process, I know, in particular, I didn't do this data set, but I know it did take quite a while to, to process. Um, you know, we have all these all these rocks, which made for good registration targets. 
course, we had the bridge footer itself. Um, but this is kind of what you're looking at in your deliverable. After data collection, after post-processing, um, you're getting a very highly accurate model of, in this case, an inshore area, a small, a small area. Um, so if you have a traditional multi-beam sonar on a surface vessel, you can, you know, this is a common use, survey an entire large area. If you want to kind of put the footer under a microscope or uh, some structure under a microscope, that's where you go in and you drop the tripod, you do your scan, and then you tie that data into the, the greater multi-beam data set just uh, just to have higher resolution in that in that particular area you're maybe worried about scouring in or, or damage um, it kind of can work in conjunction with a traditional multi-beam or a laser scanner for that matter um, which is yeah they, you know, they are they different. are very complementary complementary tools uh, to each other the multi-beam st standard standard uh, hydrographic survey multi-beam and the bv 5000s as Tyler said you can deploy them down to areas that, that might be missing data, or if there's undercut underneath the structure, you get that sonar down to the lower perspective to be able to see and actually image into the undercut itself and merge that into the to the right. multi-beam data. Yeah, and here's a laser scan uh, surface data tied to the actual BB5000 data. So it's all standard XYZ format, which is not a not a Blueview or Teledyne format. It's a very standardized point cloud format. So um, you can tie it to any other point cloud XYZ data set. Um, do we have other questions? I do have data I can show off, but questions are probably more important at this point. Sure, Hella, do you have any, uh, any questions coming in from no, I don't. Tyler, you must have really explained it really well. So no questions. So, so um, works for me. Them, I mean, give some yeah. more good information. <laughs> yeah. Well, we got a few minutes. So I'll just show some data. Um, our contacts at the end. So if you do think of a question, email me or John or or call us. We're we're happy to answer. Um, or if you have an application you think this may be a good solution for, um, definitely reach out. Uh, so a couple of data sets. Uh, a lot of these are on our website, so you may have seen them before, but I don't know how to play the data. Let me turn this off. There we go. So this is the AJ Goddard rec. Uh, this is somewhere up in Canada, Lake LaBerge. This is Lake LaBarge, yeah. La Barge. This is a, yeah. did you do this survey, John? Yeah, so yeah, I'll, I'll, oh. I'll explain it if you don't mind. So this was, uh, done with the tripod, you can see the telltale uh, donut holes all around the uh, structure itself. Um, it, it was a fairly shallow water area, um, and they were doing it was an archaeological site, so uh, there is there was divers in the water, and uh, we wanted to get the most accurate measurements possible of the structure because there was no uh, drawings of of the original structure um, in uh, anywhere. Um, so they, this is a steam-powered paddle wheel boat uh, in the gold rush era that sunk in, I believe it was 1901 um, during that gold rush era <clears throat> in uh, Lake LaBarge of Canada. And the divers, uh, you can see there's very high resolution data of all the, uh, the, the holds. Uh, there's, a, there's a stove, a wood burning stove in there. Um, and they actually turned, we turned the sonar upside down, you can see, and put it inside one of the holds to scan the ins inside of that uh, that bow section, and that's what they were archaeologists were really interested in was the uh, the hull design and and the structure itself of the vessel. So they were able to get much more detailed information than than they ever uh, uh, thought they could get by using this system in this uh, this application. Yeah, not not clear water up there, I assume, or maybe it was. No. But... It, it was okay. Uh, there there. Uh, the divers said there were some uh, good days and bad days, but um, yeah. never, so, never able to get a full, full picture of the whole structure like yeah. this. That turbidity, water clarity, generally not, not an issue for sonar, as, as we've talked about. Um, yeah, uh, laser scan tied to point cloud. Another nice uh, sunken barge data set. We, we've actually applied a unique color scheme here, so just colored it by the, the structure. Um, so again, you can really color it however you want to present to whoever you want to present to the, the end customer. Um, 
Photo mosaicing is a nice way to represent data, just tying it to a photo with Photoshop or whatever you want to use. Um, really creates a nice picture, um, which we can see in, in both of these. Kind of gives it gives it more a little more context for maybe the more untrained eye or people who aren't used to seeing this on our data. Um, dam tubes, uh, pretty simple. We're just placing the tripod outside each of these dam intake. Or right. were you on this one, John? Yeah, yeah. Again, did um, all these. yeah. This uh, was we actually had to shut down the the. These are outflow tubes from a, uh, a hydroelectric dam. Um, so they were interested if there's any major debris blocking any of these tubes from the water flowing out, um, you know, causing more resistance of the of the area. Um, this was in the early days of when I started at Blueview and uh, registering data was a little more complex then. Um, and it would have been a little more helpful if we did more scans, but they were limited on the amount of time. Um, they could shut down the dam. It was like every hour was like $100,000 to, to shut down these tubes. So um, high pressure for a new, uh, new surveyor. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, get in and scan and get out. So they didn't want, you know, so their, their focus was individual tubes. And then um, if we were, lucky enough that we could register them together uh we did um so we 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 did what we needed to do but uh the the final uh mosaic of all of them together is probably not survey grade where they're registered you know really well together uh but it's it's a fun video to have them all together yeah. And that's the case a lot of times i mean it's you know it's Jim and, difficult, Jim and Taylor, difficult i have a i have a question oh yeah go ahead um it, um, Amador asks how much time survey time is needed for a job like this, and I would assume it was either the um, uh, the, the, the steamboat. Um... Sure. So, uh, for example, the if we go to the paddle wheel boat, um, each each individual scan location, we we wanted the highest resolution possible. So each. When, and we'll go into very much more detail on this in the next uh, next webinar when we talk about the ProScan software where we set up each individual scan. But essentially, you can scan for, uh, anywhere from one degree, or I think even half a degree a second, from half a degree a second scanning up to 10 degrees a second. So depending on how, um, how detailed and um, how accurate you need the data to be and how dense you need the data to be, uh, it can be anywhere from uh, 25 minutes uh, per scan, you know, down to a couple minutes. Um, so also, if you need full coverage from the seabed as tilted far down as possible, all the way up, um, that would that would be, you know, potentially four different tilt angles for one location that you're merging together. So uh, it, it's it's hard to answer that question, uh, but yeah. it depends on, like I said, data density requirements resolution requirements, and if you're doing full 360 scans or 180 degree scans, uh, it, it can vary very significantly. Yeah, and I um, mean, the, the, the scan speed is a huge part of that. So you, you can scan up to 10 degrees per second. Um, it's gonna give you very low data density, not the highest quality data, but it's good for what I like to call like a recon scan, just for a quick scan to see that your tripod's in the right area. Um, and that's 36 seconds, right, for a full 360. It's a 36 second scan. So very quick, but once you do that, you realize, okay, my tripod landed in the right place. I'm getting everything I want. Let's slow it down to maybe two degrees per second. Uh, and now you're looking at more time in that case. Um, so that's 360, yeah, that's 720 seconds. So whatever that is in minutes. Um, and then, yeah, if you do multiple tilt angles, if you're in deeper water, you can double that. So. A lot of factors, but generally it's it's somewhat quick, depending on <laughs> what what you think is quick. And again, we'll go into that into detail on that specific topic uh, next uh, next webinar for the software. Yeah, we'll we'll kind of yeah we'll talk about exactly the time frame for putting together data once we we deep dive on that software. Good. I got another question here. Uh, first of all, a little appreciation. Great overview, guys. Will we be able to get a PDF of the presentation for future? And then there's a question. 
uh, any plans to reduce the size of BB5000 in the future, or is it driven by current transduce, transducer size? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, so the PDF, uh, Hella, I don't know if you, do we provide the actual presentation or just the recording of the webinar? Uh, we normally just provide the recording of the webinar, but I guess we can provide the PDF. Um, yeah, you can I'm say. happy to provide the PDF. Yeah, yeah. So whoever asked that question, um, we will get your contact. Obviously, we have it as oh, part sorry. of this, and, and I can send that over. Alistair Murray. Oh, all right. Oh, hi, hi, hi Alistair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll definitely send that over to you. Um, as far as the size, that's a good question, and we're always, I think Blueview, there's a focus compared to the other Teledyne sonar brands, Reson, Odom. Blueview has a niche in that we're trying to make it compact you know that's where blueview really shines being a small low power system the bb5000 is restricted in its size just because there's a lot that's required the transducer being the biggest one of the biggest parts uh, the transducers just have to be larger to generate such a narrow beam um, so as far as the sonar itself um, we kind of introduced newer iterations no nose cone um, just to improve data um, it hasn't really downsized too much, maybe a little bit. Um, I think the nose cone's gotten a little smaller, but depending on the last, the, how new the BB5000 system you have is, I'm sure you guys have seen the, the latest and greatest. Um, that's about as small as the sonar is going to get in the near term, as far as I know. Um, the pan and tilt, however, we're actually, we're kind of in the process of introducing a smaller pan and tilt, same manufacturer, same interfacing with our software, but much, much smaller pan and tilt. So we are working on downsizing the pan and tilt because the current pan and tilt we offer is a very kind of large 6,000 meter rated, you know, in, indestructible <laughs> pan and tilt. That's really kind of overkill in a way for a lot of BB5000 applications. So we're working on downsizing that so it can be more easily integrated to small ROVs or, you know, onto a smaller tripod, more easily deployable. Um, so that's that's coming very soon. That's actually one of our kind of active projects is is working on the next iteration of the BB5000, the Mark II we'll call it, um, and downsizing the pan and tilt is a big part of that. In addition to a number of other improvements, which I don't think I can talk about now. So, <laughs> but you can stay tuned because uh, we are we are working on on the product uh, as we speak. So. Thank you, Tyler. That was um, questions for now, but as uh, you said, if uh, anybody has any questions, they're free to contact okay. you. All right, both. I'll just, uh, I'll put our contacts up here. There's a bunch of troubleshooting here. Um, this was all done in the 2D webinars. So if you're if you're wondering about troubleshooting maintenance, uh, just go back and watch the other webinars we have on our, our Marine Link website. Um, I don't think it's worth going over them again. It is good, good, uh, stuff to know but um it's it's yeah. essentially identical to the 2d troubleshooting or yes. 3d troubleshooting so yeah there, uh, there is an additional pan and tilt component but that's uh that's actually quite straightforward to troubleshoot it's just a serial connection so um there's not much troubleshooting there other than getting a usb to serial driver which is easy enough so um yeah here's our, our contacts uh, feel free to email call with any questions you know, potential applications, anything at all, and we're, we're happy to help out. Okay, in that case, we're yeah, running a bit over time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, John, for another good webinar, and thank you for attending, and um, have a nice day. Yeah, we'll see you in the next one. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Join us again.